Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Digital Photography for Genealogists. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Howdy, this is James Tanner from the BYU Family History Library in Provo, Utah. Uh, we're going to talk today about digital photography for genealogists. Uh, perhaps this sounds like a little bit of a uh, out of the field kind of uh, topic, but the real basic uh, reality of the of the situation today with research is that a a camera is a necessary uh, tool for doing uh, genealogical research. Uh, the pace of research is quick quickened. Uh, the ability of, uh, of records to be the, the records are becoming more and more available. And as they become more available, uh, the number of records that can be uh, discovered uh, increases. Uh, not all of these records are going to be uh, digitized, available online, or downloadable for, to your computer. And occasionally, uh, depending on the depth of your uh, of your genealogical research or even more frequently, you may be faced with uh, microfilm copies or paper copies, uh, particularly books of, uh, of sources and information about your ancestors. Uh, digital photography is one way that you can convert that to a, a file, a document file, that can be uh, loaded into your computer and uh, used online on a uh, online family tree program or sent to uh, email or otherwise uh, shared with family members. Uh, in addition, if you have a lot of documents at home uh, that you've inherited, uh, maybe if you're like some ge genealogists have a room, in fact, that's full of documents, you can uh, cut down at least on some of that paper. Uh, you don't want to get rid of any original uh, certificates or anything that's important. But many of those documents can be uh, digitized using a camera. Uh, using a camera today is much faster than uh, in doing a dig uh, digitizing uh, documents than it would be to try to use a flatbed scanner. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, the quality of the images that can be obtained today and what you would need to, uh, to take that kind of an image. Um, why do we need to know about digital cameras? Why do we need to know about digitizing images? Uh, genealogists should use cameras to do some of the following things. So I've already mentioned you can digitize documents, those that are in uh, some type, some of the libraries and other uh, repositories and archives will not allow uh, you to uh, bring in a scanner, but they will allow you to take photographs of the, uh, of the documents. And, I've spent uh, almost hours and hours standing in a uh, special collections uh, library and taking pictures of, uh, of, of huge collections of documents that I, I felt uh, would, I would never otherwise have been able to acquire. Uh, next is to preserve memories. Obviously, we use cameras to take pictures of our family and uh, events and, and other things that have happened uh, during our lives. and these can become valuable in uh, compiling family histories and, and personal histories. Uh, and one way that, uh, that, that the uh, cameras are most useful, as I've mentioned, is to take notes from publications. 
when you're sitting in a library uh, and you have a limited time at that library, it really is uh, sort of a waste of time today to spend the whole time handwriting and copying uh, out by hand uh, the information that you find in books. Uh, when you can use a uh, smartphone or other type of camera to take the picture of the entire page uh, or pages that you need in a matter of a few seconds. Also, if you take research trips, particularly those uh, to visit cemeteries, it's very important that you document the, uh, the areas. Uh, you, if you're going to go back to the old homestead where the people, where your ancestors lived, uh, you certainly want to uh, document that trip and take as many pictures as possible. Uh, so that in future research, uh, in, in the event that, this, that the building where they lived is torn down or the cemetery gets destroyed or something, that you have a, uh, a record of, of, the, of the information that you obtained on your research chip. Those are just a few of the reasons. I'll kind of introduce you to the basics of digital photography so that you can understand what you're looking at when you go into a, a store to to purchase a, a digital camera, or if you are, uh, like many of us today, uh, buying a camera online on uh, Amazon or one of the other uh, big electronic sales websites. First of all, we need to answer the question about what is a camera. Uh, a camera is a light tight box with a way to admit a controlled amount of light containing a light sensitive material to preserve an image. That's it. That's what a camera is. Now this particular uh, little diagram here shows a box. And that is what's called a pinhole camera. And, and the very first cameras use this principle because what would happen with a very small hole into a dark room or into a dark box, the image uh, would actually form an image on the opposite side of the, uh, the, the wall where the pinhole was an inverted image of the objects on the other side of the wall. This may have been how uh, the original photographers uh, discovered the idea of, of uh, making these, uh, preserving these images. Originally, what they did is they used, uh, what the early uh, uh, people did was they used this principle to create an image on the wall, which they then drew in with, uh, with drawing instruments, uh, with charcoal or with uh, pencils or whatever, so that they could uh, create an image of, of what was out there. So first of all, we have the box, which is the camera body. And then we have the lens, which is the pinhole part of the, of the camera. And then we have a light sensitive layer. And today that is an electronic sensor. It's uh, a electronic substance that's been created through our technology that, that uh, records uh, light and turns it into an electronic, electrical uh, current that a, that a computer can then uh, create, use, to be, use the current to create an image uh, in, a, in a computer file. Uh, it may seem almost impossible, but that's, uh, that's exactly what's going on with, with uh, the digital cameras today. So here's a diagram of a uh, stylized digital camera. Uh, on the left side, you'll see the light path. That's where the light's coming into the, the lens, uh, whatever's out there on the front of the lens. You have lens elements. Uh, basically, uh, there is a direct function here between the compl how complicated the lens is and how expensive the camera is. Uh, the more, the higher quality, and the more, uh, the more work that goes into the lens, the more expensive the camera. If you're buying a camera for a very cheap price, you're getting a, uh, in most cases, you're getting a less expensive, and less complicated lens system. Uh, so when when you're upgrading a camera as a professional photographer, you're probably buying lenses that cost more than your cameras by quite a large factor. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that the lenses are interchangeable, that you uh, don't necessarily lose the, your lenses if you upgrade your camera to a, to a newer uh, model. 
the camera part of it. Uh, a lot of cameras today uh, have a, uh, are, this is a, a, called a single lens reflex camera, which means that the light comes through the uh, lens of the camera and directly onto the digital sensor at the back of the camera. The digital sensor is a, uh, is a substance that is sensitive to light and creates an electrical current. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. Uh, there is a shutter. A shutter is a mechanism to open and close the camera uh, to let the light come through the lens and hit the center, the sensor, excuse me. And the shutter, uh, a very simple shutter would uh, work at various uh, speeds. Uh, very, very, very complex shutters can, can go as fast uh, as an ability. Um, some of the more advanced cameras, which cost many thousands of dollars, can stop uh, motion. Uh, for instance, take pictures of bullets as they're flying through the air or, or bottles as they're breaking and things like that. You may have seen those kinds of pictures. Uh, we're talking about here about an average camera that has uh, the ability to leave the lens open for, for nighttime shots all the way through to, uh, say, a thousandth or two thousandth of a second, which is uh, kind of the ordinary uh, upper end speed on, a, on an average camera. Um, you'll see in the top of the camera there's called a focusing screen and an eyepiece, uh, a thing that's called a pentaprism. It's, uh, it's a piece of glass that reflects uh, what comes through the lens up into the eyepiece so that you can look through the eyepiece and focus uh, the image. Most of the newer cameras come with some kind of autofocus system uh, that uses uh, uh, a uh, ultrasonic sound uh, system to, uh, to focus off onto an object. They'll even focus in the dark, but uh, uh, there is always a way to manually focus a camera uh, if, it's, uh, if it's an adjustable lens camera. Now, cameras are divided into uh, what we call three major areas of cameras. Uh, you have what are called point-and-shoot cameras today that are cameras that have computers built into them that are set to create an optimal image given the lens and the light characteristics of that, characteristics, characteristics of that lens. So uh, all you really have to do is set it on an automatic setting like landscape or an individual or a portrait or whatever and push the button and the camera will take a, a reasonably adequate picture. Uh, there are s more sophisticated cameras uh, that are usually called interchangeable lens or digital uh, uh, single lens reflex cameras or others. And today, in fact, they're they're doing away with the mirror in the uh, in the camera, so that they're no longer uh, reflex cameras as such. They uh, they simply use the electronic sensor to create a uh, an image on a uh, screen on a LCD screen that's attached to the back of the camera and you see your image on that LCD screen and they do away with the eyepiece entirely. There is no way to directly look through the camera and see, uh, see the, the picture that's going to be taken. So there's, and then above in, in value and price, uh, we're talking about cost here, uh, above that uh, you're, you're running uh, cameras that uh, the body of the camera itself costs anywhere from three to seven thousand dollars, and the lenses begin at around uh, a few hundred dollars up to uh, the, the most expensive commercial lens that I'm aware of today runs in the neighborhood of seventeen thousand dollars for a commercial lens. That would be a fifteen to seventeen hundred millimeter Canon or Nikon lens. So, uh, you know, this can be uh, a, a fairly expensive, but from a genealogical standpoint, we're really not looking at that type of camera. We're looking at a, a, a rather simple camera that, uh, in many cases, costs less than $100. So, we have a lot of terminology here, and I may have already used some of it, so we'll have to go back now a little bit and, uh, and review and see, look at the terms. And so we're going to look at some ads for digital cameras. 
and we're going to look at two types of ads, a point and shoot ad uh, for a simple camera and a DSLR ad. And these ads were taken, uh, these descriptions were taken directly off of Amazon.com. Uh, so if you ever want to, if you want to go out and look at the ad and see uh, pricing and all that on the cameras, then you can go to Amazon. Uh, here's the words from the ad. This is a Canon PowerShot SX260HS 12.1 MP CMOS digital camera with a 20x image stabilized zoom, 20. 5 millimeter wide angle lens and, and uh, 1080 pixel full HD video, and it's in black. Okay, so now we're going to translate that into English so you'll understand exactly what this, this ad says. First of all, I'd like to show you to indicate that this particular camera costs $469 new. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated camera. Um, if I were going to spend $469 on a camera, I would not buy this one. This is my, uh, that's just my opinion. The reason being that today you can buy, for $469, you can buy a 20 megapixel camera, which is about twice as uh, high resolution and uh, gets a better image than this camera. So we're, uh, technology moves on, and uh, this was kind of your average camera out there if you were to go to uh, Walmart or to uh, Best Buy or any of the big stores out there. Uh, I'm not endorsing any of these uh, businesses, by the way. You make your own choices. Uh, I suggest you get online and look uh, at cameras for a while and you'll get an idea that uh, they do have different uh, descriptions. But we'll translate this now into English. First of all, Canon. It, Canon is the manufacturer of the camera. So you're going to see names like Canon, Nikon, uh, Kodak, uh, Sony, uh, all sorts of ca uh, camera manufacturers out there. Uh, generally, from a professional standpoint, there are two main divisions in the professional world. Uh, the main division is between those who use Canon cameras and those who use Nikon cameras. And we have, uh, we have plenty of both, and they both have their adherents. And most of them admit that they would just as soon use the other camera, but once you start buying lenses and get a camera, you're pretty much stuck with that particular camera. Uh, you certainly don't want to go out and buy, if you've, uh, if you've acquired a, a couple of thousand dollars worth of Canon lenses, you don't want to go out and buy a Nikon camera and have to respend all that money to get the same lenses again. So uh, it's kind of like uh, they used to say about the dirt roads in northern Arizona, uh, once you get in your rut, you're stuck there till you get to the end of the road, and that's sort of what the same problem you have with cameras. The next part of this is called the PowerShot SX260HS. That is the model of Canon camera. Uh, there's nothing, nothing special about the words. Uh, they're just made up. They're used for... for uh, advertising versus purposes, and the SX260, it means that someday they're going to come out with an XX, SX360 and maybe a 460, and then maybe they change the name of it from a power shot to something else. But in this case, a Canon power shot is a uh, series of cameras. There's all sorts of, of Canon power shot cameras out there. The next number is a 12.1 megapixel. Now, a 12.1 megapixel camera today is about an average camera. If you look at a, um, a smart at a smart uh, phone, like an iPhone or an Android phone, for example, most of those today are are coming out with an 8 megapixel camera. So what's in your uh, in your phone is uh, almost as good as this uh, standalone handheld camera. Uh, the new Apple iPhones, by the way, that are coming out this year are rumored. They haven't actually been introduced yet, but they're rumored to have a 12.1 megapixel camera. Um, in fact, I'm, maybe the two new ones do have the 12.1 megapixel camera. But uh, that's, uh, this is about the, the average uh, range. Now, what does it mean by megapixel? A megapixel means how many dots little tiny dots might go into the, the uh, sensor uh, where each of those little tiny sensors are 
and how many of those there are on the sensor that will make up the image. So the, the more you have, the theoretically, the higher the resolution. It, it might be interesting to know that there are cameras today that go above 50 megapixels in uh, resolution. And it's interesting because Canon has a, a, a camera that will go, that is 50 mega, over 50 megapixel camera. But the professionals who are using that type of camera have discovered that the camera itself is not as useful as it could be because the slightest movement creates distortion in the, in the image. So the only way that they're actually useful is if they're put on a tripod and uh, used with a remote uh, release where you, you take a picture without touching the camera. So there's, uh, there's an upper limit here. Uh, it technically, uh, 12 megapixels is uh, perfectly adequate for taking pictures, any of the pictures that you would possibly conceivably need for uh, uh, genealogy purposes. And in fact, if you're taking pictures of documents, uh, then you are, uh, then an eight megapixel camera is, is really sufficient. But what happens here is that you wanna take a picture of a photograph. So reproducing a photograph if you take a picture with a, um, a flatbed scanner, if you put a photograph down on a flatbed scanner and scan it at 300 dots per inch, which is a fairly common uh, re uh, measure of the amount of, of detail in the photo, you'll get a very adequate photo that can be reproduced online or printed, a copy of the, of the flat paper photo. If you put that same photo in front of a 12 megapixel camera, the image will not be as good as a flatbed scanner at 300 dots per inch. What you will get is a, um, in order to get the same level of quality, you will need a camera that has at least 20 megapixel image. Okay, so the next one is the CMOS. Uh, a CMOS is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. There'll be a test at the end of this webinar for all of you. Uh, but no, that uh, is another one of those things that uh, nobody really needs to know. Uh, but uh, I always get a question, well, what does CMOS mean? Well, it means complementary metal oxide semiconductor, and it's the, tech, it's the imaging part of the camera itself. And then... The next one is the 20x image stabilized zoom. What that means is that this camera has a lens that as you rotate that lens, it will make the image appear to, um, to increase. So you'll get uh, closer and closer to an image. The 20x zoom is a fairly good standard zoom. Um, the quality here of a Canon camera with a 20x zoom is, is excellent. Uh, a zoom makes it much easier for you to, uh, to focus in on a specific subject. Uh, for example, if you're taking a picture of your, of your family, uh, you may want to zoom out and uh, get a larger or we'll call it a wider field of view. Uh, but if you wanted to take a picture of an individual, you'll want to zoom in and have the ability to capture a, a small area. Um, at the present time, I'm using a camera uh, quite frequently. It's a Sony camera that has a 35x zoom. It's the equivalent of a 1700 millimeter lens, and it, it is an extremely useful camera to have. Um, just makes it very much e easier to use. The other side of this is the 25 millimeter wide angle. That's the, that's the uh, zoom out part of it. That's how far out uh, if you if you go to 25 millimeters with that lens as you turn the lens or, uh, in front of the camera, then that will bring that image wider and wider. You'll get a greater and greater amount of image. So if you can't get everybody into the picture, then you can uh, adjust the lens so that you can get everybody in the picture. If you want to get one person, then you can zoom in on that one person. So there's, uh, you know, there's an advantage here to having this. And uh, as long as these cameras are uh, from, uh, I would call them the mainstream uh, manufacturers, you can, you can probably 
uh, rely on them to be uh, fairly useful. Although there is also very something that's very important, as you, uh, if you're familiar with purchasing items through Amazon or any of the other large online uh, retailers, you'll you'll always uh, often see, not always, but you'll often see uh, reviews of the product. And I am a strong uh, advocate of reading the reviews because they will give you a good idea about the, the product's uh, capabilities and whether or not there's any particular problems. Uh, one uh, one re little bit of restraint on reading reviews is that there's always somebody out there that gives it a one, no matter what it is. They always give it a one star rating for some reason. Uh, they're just unhappy people who just have bought the wrong product. Uh, the, other, uh, the other side, uh, if everyone uniformly gives it five stars, uh, then you uh, then you kind of have to make up your mind if you want to go along with the group or if they all have a reason for thinking that it's really that good. Um, the next one is the uh, 1080 full HD video. Now, what this means is that this camera not only will take still images where you take a picture of a person sitting there, but it does video, just the kind of same kind of video you get out of a video camera. Uh, if you uh, today... Uh, unless you're doing, uh, even if you're doing major video productions, you may buy one of these kinds of cameras to do your, uh, to produce your videos. Um, many of the movies today, by the way, are being, uh, commercial movies are actually being uh, taken, photographs, uh, the movies made on, uh, out of Canon cameras, high-end Nikon and Canon cameras. Uh, the Canon cameras uh, are now being used for, full-blown uh, commercial production videos. Um, so these cameras have, have kind of made it uh, not so necessary. They're like your phone. Your phone will take movies. Uh, they don't sometimes do as great a job as they could otherwise, but these cameras do a much better job than a phone of taking a video. So there's all sorts of things. Now the last thing here is the camera is actually black. So that's... Um, uh, Here's your uh, what the camera looks like, and that's what that parentheses at the end says. Um, I went in and to buy a camera, and I wanted the red one, but they wouldn't. They they wanted to charge me more for the red camera, so I ended up. I think the one I got ended up being purple or something. I don't know, some off color. Uh, to me, I don't really care. Some people obviously do. So here we are. This is the ads, and that's what the camera looks like. Pretty simple. Uh, device there, um, and that's what all those words mean. Okay, so now we're going to look at a different camera. This is a single lens reflex, reflex camera, an SLR. Uh, they're called DSLRs, or digital single lens uh, cameras, and we'll go through the, uh, the words here quickly. First of all, we have, uh, oops, didn't want to do that. Uh, first of all, we have the, uh, the model, the Canon EOS, which is the, uh, the series of cameras, uh, that's important from a Canon standpoint because they sell two different kinds of lenses uh, for their cameras, and they're not interchangeable. Uh, so you need to buy, if you're buying a lens for this camera, and these are interchangeable lens cameras, the, the lenses are, uh, when you buy the camera, they come with what's called the kit. That's K-I-T, a kit lens or one or two kit lenses, and uh, those are inexpensive lenses that are, uh, that are sort of sold with the camera body. Uh, most photographers, uh, professional photographers, will um, upgrade those lenses uh, and buy the camera body separate, and so they're not, uh, they're really not caring what kit lens comes with the camera. Uh, but in this case, some people do buy the, the kit, and so they get the, uh, the, the lenses that come from Canon which, by the way, are usually very good lenses. And if you think about it, uh, as the way that photographers do, uh, the important part of the camera is not the box. It's not any of the other parts. It's the lens. That's where the image is created. That's where you, the camera has the uh, resolution. Uh, and uh, you can really tell a difference between a high-end camera that has a good lens and a camera that has a cheap lens. Uh, 
The 5D Mark III is the model of this Canon. It's a 22.3 megapixel full frame camera. Now, this brings up an entirely different subject. The sensors that go into these cameras come in different sizes, and we'll show, I'll show that in just a minute. Uh, but uh, the size of the sensor makes a difference on the quality of the, of the image. So a full frame 22.3 uh, megapixel camera is significantly higher quality than the previous camera we looked at that had a smaller sensor. And it is a way, it's a w world of difference between this camera and the, the sensor that you have in your phone uh, from, a, uh, from a photography standpoint and being able to reproduce uh, high quality images. And it, once again, it's a CMOS. And, uh, the, that's the type of sensor. And it has 1080 full HD video. And uh, then it's an SLR, or a single lens reflex camera. And that's the body of the camera. And, and if the, the word body is there, it means it's being sold without any lenses. Even if they have a lens on the picture of the camera, it's still being sold without a lens. OK, so don't get caught there. OK, now let's talk about the camera itself and uh, talk about megapixels, also uh, abbreviated MP, or sensors and lenses, and, and get a little bit about those things. Um, first of all, megapixels. Um, this is uh, this this is a it isn't actual size. It's a diagram that you can find online and in, in many different places that talks about uh, what it would look like. The size of an image would be, and there are inches across the top. So uh, it's one, the one, two, three, four that you can hardly see there. Uh, those are inches and down the side. So it's a, uh, so a four by six inch uh, photo, for example, which would be the standard photo size um, for printed photos, um, or even an eight and a half by 11. In other words, you go out to see which size it would be. So let's suppose that you wanted to take an eight and a half by 11 photo, which is size of a standard piece of paper. And uh, usually, uh, photos would be printed at 8 by 10 rather than 8, eight and a half by 11. But uh, let's just say it's an 8 by 10, which would be a standard uh, sized photo uh, for a display in a, in a frame. Uh, if you go to that, you'll see that a, uh, the, the area, if you go to the two, two different scales, uh, the purple part that says 8 in it is closest to the 8 by 10. What that means is that you would get 300 dots per inch if you print an 8 megapixel image at an 8 by 10 photo. OK, so if you had a 2 megapixel camera and you tried to print it at 8 by 10, you'd be able to see the dots, the little pixels dots. Uh, you know, that's the standard thing that you hear about is pixelation, where you get uh, you see the little squares on the image. That's what would happen if you did that with a two megapixel. So your two megapixel camera would only show the high quality 300 dots per inch at a four by five inch print or four by six inch print. So even if you did a four by six inch print, it's going to be a little bit pushing on a two megapixel. So when you add megapixels, when you go higher quality, then what it's saying is that you can print that size of a picture at 300 dots per inch. So it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily get any higher quality at a lower, uh, at a lower size. You get the ability to increase the size without losing the quality. Now, why is that the case? The case is that when they print a photograph, today, they use and usually use some kind of an inkjet process. And the inkjet process is only 300 dots per inch. So no matter high, if you print, if you had a 44 megapixel camera and you printed a 8 by 10 inch uh, photo, you took a photo and then you printed it at 8 by 10 at 300 dots per inch, 
it would be exactly the same resolution and quality as if the camera only had eight megapixels. So you're in a sense wasting all those extra megapixels. You're not getting any more higher quality. You're really just getting a higher, larger ability to print larger prints. Now, if I use a 20 megapixel camera out here, then I should be able to 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 um, print a, an, a 12 or 13 or 14 by 18 inch uh, photo and have it be perfect 300 DPI high quality, depending on the printer that I use to print the, the photograph. So that's that's this relationship of megapixels. And as I'm as I'm indicating, for most of our purposes as genealogists, eight megapixels is max. I mean, we don't really don't need more. It's nice. It's always nice. You know, it's nice to have cars that'll go 200 miles an hour too. But there's no place in Utah that you could drive it uh, unless you've got a track someplace. But uh, that's the same thing with uh, with high megapixel cameras. Now, professional level is more than 20 megapixels today. Uh, if you were to try to sell your photographs, for example, if you were a professional photographer selling photographs, they would require uh, at least 16, uh, an effective 8 megapixels, but up to 16 megapixels would be the minimum. And in many of, many of the uh, publications today will not take less than a 20 megapixel image. Uh, for example, uh, very high-end magazine, Arizona Highways, which is known all over the world for its photography, uh, their requirement is at least a 20 megapixel image. Okay, so now let's see what it looks like. Uh, this on the uh, on the left there is what we're talking about when we call, call it pixelated. Uh, and that's a very low resolution image. Now the interesting thing is that if you were to stand way back from your screen and look at that, the further back you got, the more the more detail it would look like it had. Okay, but that's that's what we're talking about when we're talking about megapixels. Okay, now we're going to talk about sensors, and those are the little chips, uh, the electronic chips, the CMOS chips that go in these cameras, and. Um, uh, you can equate this, the small ones at the left-hand side up to the bigger ones on the right-hand side. And uh, these, uh, the different sizes there uh, are directly, absolutely directly related to the cost of the camera. So the larger the sensor, the more expensive the camera. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, anything in the range of the, uh, of the smaller sensors, the first uh, four or five sensors there are what you're going to see in, um, in the point and shoot cameras uh, for anywhere between $100, a little below $100, up to around <coughs> $300. Uh, beginning with the uh, turquoise red ones there, you're looking at cameras that are going to run you between uh, three and four hundred and five hundred dollars, maybe up to six hundred dollars. By the time you move to the next two larger sensors, you're into cameras that cost over a thousand dollars. And for a full-frame sensor camera today, uh, you're going to pay somewhere between twenty-five hundred and three thousand dollars for the camera body. Uh, so they're they're fairly expensive. Now the last one over there is called a medium format. And those cameras are running four to five thousand dollars for the camera bodies or more, depending on the on the type. Now these prices have come down dramatically over the last few years. This sounds like a lot of money for a camera, and it is, but it's nothing compared to what it would have cost five or ten years ago. Uh, ten years ago, uh, a full frame digital camera was probably be about four or five megapixels and cost about six or eight thousand dollars. So there, there's prices have come down dramatically on cameras. Now here we are with lenses, and this is the Canon lens system. Um, and uh, you can see that there are a lot of different types of lenses. Uh, that's why I think that point and shoot cameras with uh, with the zoom, with the ability to zoom in and out, are so popular. It's because they they uh, approximate the uh, what these camera lenses do. Uh, obviously, you don't get the quality, but you do get the, use, the, the cost and the, and the versatility. 
And once again, uh, this is an area where if you need them, if you need a lens like this, you'll know what you want. If you, uh, if you don't, if this just means like you're seeing a bunch of pictures of things, you have no idea what these things do, then you obviously do not need it, and you will probably be super happy with a camera that costs less than 100 bucks. So I would just uh, uh, not even worry about this kind of thing unless you actually understand what you're getting here. Um, there's lots of people that get enthusiasts. We have, we call them prosumers. Uh, they're people who are who want professional level level equipment, but they're actually consumers. They're not really trying to to become professional photographers, or they don't even have the the interest in being professional. They're more interested in the equipment uh, than they are in the cam in the in the product from the camera. Okay, so now. This is the difference between a wide angle and a, uh, uh, what we call wide angle lens and what we call a telephoto lens. The, the dividing line here, the, they're all measured in millimeters, so they're all mm or millimeters. And a 35 millimeter is a standard camera. Uh, what, is, what is considered to be a one to one ratio, if I were to take a picture of, of uh, something, and the camera was reproducing that uh, at one to one without any uh, uh, making it larger than normal or or less than uh, in, in a telephoto sense. The the dividing line is a 50 millimeter lens, so a 50 millimeter lens is a, is the zero point. Uh, anything that a number that's higher than 50 millimeters is considered to be a telephoto lens. Anything less than 50 millimeters is, is considered to be a 25, is a wide angle lens. So the 35 millimeter here is a wide angle lens. And you can see if uh, the first picture in the upper left was taken with the 35 millimeter lens, the one directly below it was taken from the exact same position, pointed at the same spot with a 70, mil 70 millimeter lens. And then the next picture was taken from the same spot with a 200 millimeter lens. And then the fourth picture at the lower right was taken from the exact same spot with a 420 millimeter lens. So a 420 millimeter lens is a telephoto lens, like a telescope. You're looking at uh, making a magnification of a small area of the of the of the image. And uh, People who mostly use telephoto lenses are um, uh, wildlife photographers, birders, uh, people who are out looking for birds and taking pictures of birds, um, landscape people, uh, all sorts of people would be interested in telephoto lenses. Genealogists, um, not so much. Uh, they are basically wanting a standard lens, a uh, good idea to have a, um, uh, an adjustable lens simply because uh, paper sizes differ. You may want to take a picture of a newspaper, or you may want to take a picture of a postcard. Uh, so there's a, a difference there. And, and having a zoom lens may be a help in that circ circumstances. So here's, here's the area. Uh, we all call this the focal length uh, of the lens. But uh, here you have a uh, 20 millimeter lens. And if you zoomed in, uh, with the lens, those those receding boxes there would be the area of the photo that would be taken by the camera. So as you zoom in with your telephoto lens, you get a smaller and smaller area uh, of the photo. Most people are perfectly happy to get a standardized uh, shot with a point-and-shoot camera with a fixed, what's called a fixed lens, which means it takes only one um, uh, focal length. It will just take whatever it happens to be. And those are the least expensive cameras of all. OK, so next we're going to talk about taking a photograph a little bit. Uh, nothing that you need to know uh, to be a, uh, a professional, but uh, things that, some very basic things that will help you to, uh, to take better pictures. Um, I can tell you over the years I have seen some 
really horrible pictures. <laughs> and the problem is we're communicating. Uh, photography is a mode of communication. Um, and it also can be a, a mode of artistic expression. But uh, from a genealogical standpoint, we're wanting, to, we're wanting to communicate. And if we don't communicate well, uh, then uh, the photograph can be uh, a, pretty, uh, uh, a pretty difficult thing to, uh, to live with. First of all, we have uh, the concept of f-stops. And, and what these do is, this is, there's a diaphragm in the camera that opens and closes the lenses. Um, obviously, if you walk from a, a bright sunshine outside into a, into a darkened room, your eyes have to adjust to the amount of light that's available. Well, the camera does that by this diaphragm uh, called the aperture uh, that uh, in most cameras, opens and closes today automatically, so you don't have to really go in and set the f-stop or the, the deeps. On an adjustable camera, all of these different settings are adjustable. On most of the, the, the computerized cameras today, uh, you simply set what you want to, the type of photo that you want to take, and the camera does all the rest of the, of the adjustments. Um, there is a reason for wanting to be able to adjust the uh, the aperture, and that is what is called the depth of field. Um, uh, the larger the uh, number here, the greater, the smaller the aperture. So this is one of the probably one of the more difficult parts of understanding a camera is that an f22 has a really, really tiny little opening, and an f2 has a very large opening. In fact, very few cameras that you would buy today for under um, $1,000 would be able to have a lens that would be anything close to an F2 lens. Now, interestingly, some of the uh, point-and-shoot cameras and, um, and smartphones today, the iPhones and Android phones that are out there, have F2.8 lenses. So they're very... They're very uh, um, very fast lenses, and they, but they have a very low depth of field, which means that if you don't have it focused, then everything is out of focus. In the depth of field, you have a greater depth of distance from the camera that's in focus. So without that, you're not going to be able to get good focused pictures. So this is what happens if you don't have the camera focused. Um, uh, focus has to do with, uh, with just like focusing your eyes. Sometimes you difficulty uh, when you wake up in the morning focusing on things. Well, the camera has to be focused also. A lot of cameras, uh, particularly those that we call point-and-shoot cameras, have uh, automatic focusing systems which may or may not work. Sometimes you'll get a photo where it focuses on the wrong part of the photo of, of the image and uh, the part you want, which is the person, is out of focus and the rest of it's in sharp focus. So uh, it's, it's uh, a little bit of a trick when you're focusing or working with the camera. And if you have these cameras that have the LCD screen, the little T, you know, monitor type screen on the back of the camera, uh, sometimes they're adjustable so you can hold the camera over your head or off to the side or whatever and still see the image. Uh, I find those to be very, very difficult to maintain good focus. Uh, that's, uh, and of course, one of, the, one of the major reasons that a, a camera image might be out of focus is because the person moved the camera during the time that the, that the image was being taken. So uh, holding the camera steady is important. Now composition is another thing. Um, if you think about uh, the way that uh, an artist thinks of, of, of a picture, we have what's called the golden mean. We have a, 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 a way of dividing uh, images into uh, pleasing um, compositions uh, that people just instinctively, uh, almost universally, will say, that's better than this. If I were to show you a bad composition and a good composition, uh, usually almost all the people will agree that this is a better composition. And that's what starts to make, uh, it make, makes it into, uh, when you become a, a more, a more uh, experienced and more knowledgeable photographer, 
this is the part of taking pictures that is the most difficult to to obtain is the composition part. Now we're all dealing with light and uh, we have to worry about how much light there is and most of us when we buy one of these point and shoot cameras uh, are um, are not no longer concerned with it so much. Uh, in addition if the light gets too low we push a little button on the camera and up flap up the little flash flips up or the camera on your uh, phone tells you you need to turn on your flash and you use the flash uh, coming out of the camera to take the picture. I'm always interested to watch sporting events and football games and things like that uh, when people are sitting in the in the stands and they're all sitting up there flash 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 with their camera trying to take pictures of the field. And the answer is that these flashes effective distance is about 10 feet and so anything past 10 feet is just lost to one of these little flash camera things. So. Uh, uh, turn your flash off, take pictures if they come out, great if they don't. Uh, by the way, I, um, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I've been involved in photography since I was about eight years old. Uh, I've been taking thousands and thousands of pictures over my lifetime, uh, presently uh, selling pictures as a professional photographer. And uh, uh, I, I almost never use a flash. I have, I just, as a rule, just do not use a flash. And particularly if you're a genealogist, you are not going to be using a flash in a, in a uh, library. They are just going to send you right out the door the first time you flash your camera. So uh, you are gone if, uh, if you use a flash. So you need to learn how to take photos without a flash, uh, which usually requires holding the camera very still or using a tripod or some other mechanism to hold the camera still. Um, exposure values uh, is, the mo is one of the more complex uh, parts of the camera. Uh, all we have to really know as genealogists is that the camera takes care of this most of the time and uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the exposure. Uh, it's pretty obvious when a picture is overexposed uh, or underexposed, which means that you, it's very dark or very light and all the detail is blown out of it. and Usually that uh, just means that that photo is unusable. But you really would like to have good usable photos if you spent your afternoon taking pictures of documents in the library. So my, my suggestion is that you uh, check uh, the image uh, or the series of images as you're going along and make sure that they're coming out. Uh, I went on a, a trip recently. Uh, and I used my digital camera and unfortunately for the first whole day of the trip uh, the, uh, the, the memory card in the camera was not seated properly and I lost all the photos. So uh, you really need to check your equipment and make sure that you're getting pictures out of your equipment as you go along. Now we're going to talk a little bit about file formats. This is another area that can get complicated. The most common file format, this means what uh, the camera records is a file that's then transferred to a computer, usually through a, a USB cable that connects directly to the camera and directly to your computer. Or it can off today many of the ca many cameras will uh, automatically uh, upload the photos in their uh, in their memory by Wi-Fi directly to the camera without even plugging it in. So my latest camera, I just set it beside the, the, the computer and turn on the Wi-Fi and it just uploads all my pictures without ever having to plug any, any cables or do anything. But the pictures, the basic format here is called a JPEG format. Uh, from an archive standpoint, this is not preferable, but it's, it's uh, serviceable and usable. But uh, we would prefer to have uh, either PNG, which are uh, a higher quality and do not lose um, the quality when they're edited, or TIFF, which is even a higher quality image. And finally, the, the, the ultimate image is a raw image, which is uh, captures all the information from the camera. Most JPEG and other cameras like that uh, actually develop the image inside the camera before you upload it to your computer. Uh, raw images are undeveloped in a sense. They're just 
whatever the sensor in the camera saw. And they will need to be developed and uh, in a program like uh, Photoshop or Photoshop Elements or some other photo manipulation program. That brings us to the almost to the end of this, and that is that the programs that you might use, and and the most popular ones, and the ones used by uh, by the most people professionally and otherwise, there are literally hundreds of different photo manipulation programs out there. Believe me, but uh, the those who are uh, doing a lot of photographs appreciate uh, photo Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, Lightroom, and Bridge. Uh, the good news about this is that uh, these are very good programs. Elements is the least expensive and usually runs between 100 and 150 or so dollars. Uh, Photoshop is very expensive. I have no idea how much it costs anymore since Adobe has transferred its entire program over to a subscription service. So now rather than buying the programs individually, uh, we subscribe to Adobe and they allow us to download uh, all of the programs that they have available. So um, it's, uh, and that turns out to be much cheaper than, than uh, buying copies of the program and updating them every so often. But Lightroom and Bridge are, are programs used uh, not only to manipulate the photos but to organize and store them. These are very high-end programs, uh, very sophisticated programs. Um, but uh, an Elements does the same thing <coughs> for a much less price, less price for people who, are not, who do not need that level of sophistication. Okay, well, thank you so much for watching today. We're, we're broadcasting here from the um, BYU, Brigham Young University, Harold B. Lee Library. Uh, we're in the BYU Family History Library portion, uh, actually downstairs uh, underground here. And uh, we are producing these webinars on a very regular basis. If you go to the BYU Family History Library webpage, uh, just simply do the, put that in your uh, in Google or whatever search engine you're using. Uh, type in BYU Family History Library, and you will find our page in an up, upper right-hand corner of the page. You can click on and receive the schedule. As get a, a PDF copy of the of the webinar schedule in the future. Thank you for watching.